Let's start with growing up in Iowa. What was growing up in Iowa like? Well, it was a good time to grow up in Iowa. Uh, we, in, in a sense, and then of course it changed to the big depression while I was there, so I lived through it. But my life started out on a farm. My, uh, my father was a farmer, and then my mother died when I was 11 years old. And we moved to Solon, Iowa, which was a town of, of about 500 people. And uh, I went to, uh, well, uh, at that time I was thinking the eighth grade. Uh, wait, let's see, might, might have been a little bit earlier. But I was in the, I, I was in the Solon schools uh, uh, for my whole, from the second grade on up to the time, the end of my sophomore year. Now, in in Solon, Iowa was the first time I was sort of independent in life because we came to live with my grandmother, my father and I, and my brother because of my mother's death. And uh, they didn't sort of pay much attention to me. This, I went to school every day. And the dad did buy me a bicycle, which was the first time I'd ridden the bicycle uh, at that time. I mean, a little story on that is I remember I got on a little hill and ran down the hill and ran into my grandmother's flower garden and smashed her flowers, and I was not very popular that day. But uh, then I needed some spending money. They didn't give me any allowance. And so I saw an ad in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, one of the local magazines, and... Uh, it was by the Real Silk Company that made Real Silk hosiery and and women's underclothes mainly, and they wanted they were advertising for salesmen. So I wrote to them and said I'd like to be a salesman, and they didn't inquire as to my age, and so I got a beautiful leather, uh, kind of a looking like a briefcase, a leather thing with samples of all their stockings and their goods that they put into other clothing. And I sold real silk for uh, two years uh, while, I was, uh, while I was at my grandmother's. And um, that gave me enough money so I could be independent. Uh, in school at Solon, I was uh, tied for sort of the top of my class. And my big competition was a first cousin of mine whose name was Arlo. and. Uh, uh, we used to go biking together, and, and we competed to get the better grades. And, and uh, this was a, sort of a, uh, my constant friend. And then uh, he one day disappeared, and he lost his mind. And uh, he went to, a, to an asylum after that and never recovered. Uh, he didn't even know where he was afterwards. So my best friend had troubles. Uh, in the Solon schools, one of the things I took was manual training, which was a woodworking shop. And that has always been uh, something I've been happy to have done because uh, throughout life I've had to use my hands and to have some sort of formal training in the use of woodworking tools was, was a good basis for things that I did later. Uh, now at Solon, there were several things that were important to the future in my life. Uh, and I should have mentioned just before we, uh, my mother died, my father brought home a one-tube Crosley radio. And uh, uh, he gave me the uh, responsibility of getting this thing set up and making it work. In those days, it took a big outside antenna, which I strung from the house to a tree, which had to be oh, at least 100 feet long. And then you had to bring a wire down from it and go in through the window into the house. And then you had to have a ground, which was a stake you pounded into the ground and brought a wire up from it and brought into the house. And these then hooked into the radio receiver. And we had only headphones in those days. And this was a big revelation to me because I'd never sort of heard the world before then. Now we're getting world news. I was uh, able to listen to ball games for the first time. And one of the evening programs was a, uh, came from a station called WOS in St. Louis. And uh, it came from the prison. And the fellow who played, uh, who was on this program from the prison played the piano. They call him the King of the Ivories. And he stayed on it for two years, became so popular 
and people all send him money and the prison deposited the money in the bank and then the governor pardoned him and so he went off the air after that. <laughs> but this was my first experience with radio and I got very interested in it and I sort of learned how it worked. It was a simple device and that's not too hard to do in those days. And then that sort of laid the, my, uh, my basis for my interest in electronics in later life. Then the next thing was that the local uh, school had a, a, a band director and uh, he needed some players in the band. And so he came around and wanted to know if I would be willing to learn to play an instrument and he was lacking a couple instruments, you know, lacking a bass horn actually and drums and I chose the drums and then I, uh, he could teach the drums it turned out, he was fairly good at it. And then I got a book on how to be a drummer and uh, my father bought me a marching drum because that's all they needed then, it was a high school band. And so I used to march outside with this drum bouncing on my knee and I would uh, learn, I learned to play the drum well enough to be in the band. Uh, then a little bit later, before we left Solon, uh, my father had a friend who used to be a, a trap drummer in a jazz band. And he was not going to play anymore, so he wanted to sell his trap drums. So my father bought those trap drums for me. So I had, now that's a bass drum and a snare drum and some cymbals and wood blocks and that sort of thing that goes with uh, trap drumming. And uh, he bought that, and so I then went over to the school, set him up in the basement. They let me do that, and I would practice my trap drumming in the basement <laughs> and learn to be uh, somewhat proficient in it. Then at the end of my sophomore year, my father, well, my father just before that had remarried, and uh, we moved then to Mount Vernon, Iowa. Now, Mount Vernon, Iowa is near Cedar Rapids. It's about halfway between Solon, where I was, and Cedar Rapids. And uh, I should have mentioned that Solon's only 10 miles north of Iowa City, where the University of Iowa is, so you kind of get it located. But then Cedar Rapids is the biggest, second biggest city in the state of Iowa. And um, Mount Vernon is about, uh, I think, 14 miles east of Cedar Rapids. And the when the main highways between the East Coast and the West Coast started in New York and went to San Francisco was called the Lincoln Highway. And the Lincoln Highway, or Route 30 it was then, went right down Main Street in Mount Vernon, Iowa. So that Mount Vernon was always kind of a place where there was a lot of tra traffic going through. And uh, there was also uh, bus service from there to Cedar Rapids, so it was easy to get back and forth to Cedar Rapids. Now my father uh, w w started a hardware store jointly with a first cousin of his. They called it Baronic Hardware. And they, uh, of course, sold all kind of hardware, and they also had a farm machinery business. They sold uh, McCormick during a farm machinery, and they sold radios uh, as well. In those days, there was a radio called Atwater Kent. There was an RCA radio that was quite uh, well known. And uh, uh, my father then, and I was entering my sophomore year in high school. I got through my freshman year in Solon. And my father said, you know, uh, we sell these radios and they have to be installed and sometimes repaired seems to me you ought to learn radio. Uh, and then you could do that for the store. We now have a college student, a senior over at college, uh, see, I guess he was a junior then, over at college who uh, does this radio work for us, but he's gonna be graduating. And maybe you could sort of learn so you could take over after that. Is this when um, your dad paid for the correspondence course? That's exactly right. And he then got the International Correspondence School course on radio. And I took this very seriously. The course was really pretty good for its time. And uh, they had sort of examinations and, and you'd send the exams in and they'd grade them and this kind of thing. And I studied it real hard. And then in my, the next year, which would be my junior year, my father 
uh, talked the uh, service man whose name was Francis Pratt, uh, and he was going to Cornell College, and Cornell College is in Mount Vernon, Iowa also. Cornell College is 12 years older than Ithaca College, and uh, it is, uh, has about 1,000 students. Even to this day, it's about 1,000 students. Liberal arts school. And uh, uh, so uh, Francis Pratt was a senior, would be a, was going to be a senior when I was a junior in high school, so he was about ready to finish up and leave Mount Vernon. And so my father talked to him into taking me on as an apprentice, and I would charge nothing and then I would work with him on fixing radios. So I would go over there quite often, I don't know, it was every afternoon light, and we would, uh, he, would, he would have collected a radio or two that had to be repaired, and then he taught me how to, how to test tubes and change the transformers and look for troubles. And, and uh, uh, then also he was an opera buff, so he had a phonograph which he'd play these, these uh, large records in those days. They had three minutes per side. And we would play uh, opera that mainly came from the Chicago Civic Opera Company. And so I got used to the, and that was also RCA came, I guess took all the Met people too. But we'd listen to these operas while we fixed radios. So that also stimulated my interest in, in this kind of music. <clears throat> was that... Is that where you sort of originated your love of music? Was it that Well, time? of course, I was already playing drums, remember. And then when I got to Mount Vernon, and I don't remember, it was probably my junior year, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the local fellow who ran the local uh, electrical rip, uh, shop, and he did uh, wired homes and did that sort of thing, uh, he was also a saxophone player, and quite a good one. And he decided to put together a band, and he was, he played saxophone, and he got uh, four of us to play with him, and asked me if I would play drums, because he heard I was uh, had the drums, and and I don't know whether I how I'd shown that that I could do it. But then he tried me out, of course, and said, "Okay, you're good enough. You can play drums with." this little band. So we put together this six-piece uh, band for dance band, and uh, we played at concerts in mainly in Cedar Rapids. They, they would have the local uh, uh, Elks Lodge would have dances every Saturday night, and we'd play for Elks dances, and, and then it got so that we'd play occasionally in Mount Vernon for the student groups. and, and uh, uh, and then gradually we started traveling greater distances, and it's sort of a crazy group in the band, but we did uh, we did uh, enjoy the the music, and it made me some money. And then at the end of my junior year, now Francis Pratt had graduated, so I now became the radio man, and uh, I now started. I set up a little shop above the hardware store. They had a room up there they were not using, and. Uh, a little ad in the newspaper, radio repairs, and and uh, my father gave him the business from the store, and I became the radio man for Mount Vernon, Iowa, and I fixed radios all over the town as they needed. Some needed new tubes, and sometimes there'd be some parts burn out in them, and uh, I had got a pretty good course of sprouts with Francis Pratt, so that I was able to to handle this quite well. The result was that by the end of my uh, end of my uh, uh, high school, uh, I, I then I had applied to Cornell and they, I was able to be admitted. And of course, my grades in high school were okay. And um, uh, the tuition at that time at Cornell was four hundred dollars a year, and I had saved about five hundred dollars because I lived at home with my parents and ate and lived there and I took radio money and playing in the dance band money and put it in the bank. So in the local bank I had saved up about $500. Then it came in August uh, in 1931 I think it was when I graduated from high school and after I graduated from high school and uh, 
uh, I uh, thought, began thinking there's bank failures going on. Now, this is the start of the Big Depression, 1931, and bank failures were going on. I got worried about my $500. So I went over to the bank that day. This was in August. And, and I asked for $400. And uh, the teller said, well, I can't give that to you. I got to call the, the vice president. And the vice president came over and said, uh, what are you going to do with the money? And I said, I'm going to pay my tuition for a year at Cornell College. Well, he said, if you want it for any other purpose, I wouldn't give it to you. The next morning, the bank closed for permanently. And I lost my last $100 in the bank failure. What excellent timing. Timing, incredible, just unbelievable. And the uh, result was that I was paid through one year of tuition at Cornell College. And um, I continued then the fix radios and, and uh, play in the dance band. And uh, uh, then uh, in the sophomore year, things got a little harder uh, in terms of being able to, to earn money and the school was not too interested in giving me much scholarship help. They gave me, I think, $100 or so. But they claimed they had to give this to all the kinds of students there now. And they didn't have that much scholarship money to give me a complete scholarship. And then in my, uh, it became apparent in my, uh, start of my junior year, or in the, in that uh, really I, I couldn't make the money to get pay my tuition. So I decided to look for a job for one year. So I went to, uh, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and there was a new young company there called the Collins Radio Company. Now that's now a big national uh, company which actually sells the radios that you find in almost all airplanes and navigation equipment and that kind of thing. It's a big company today, but then it was just starting up. And Arthur Collins was the young president. And uh, I told him I wanted to get a job. And, and he said, uh, uh, OK, we, we'll give you a job. So I went to Collins Radio Company and was there during the year that was really the would be my junior year. But it was I took it off that, that year and, and, stay, and worked for the Collins Radio Company. And uh, the, the, this turned out to be very good. The first part of it, I was traveling, I was put in with the traveling salesman. We were going out and sell sound systems around Iowa, particularly the funeral homes. And so I understood equipment because I've been fixing radios. I understood equipment and the salesman was understood how to sell. And so we traveled together around the state and. And uh, that business didn't pay off well enough, so Collins decided after a few months that uh, he was going to stop that. And so then he said I could work in the engineering department as an assistant to the engineers. And this was good because they had a group of young engineers there, and uh, I was able to sort of, uh, they, they would give me a diagram, for example, and say assemble the parts. and and put this thing together on a breadboard, and then we can test it. And they give me a diagram of what they wanted to build. And so I could do those experimental things for them that year. And this, this worked out quite well, because uh, uh, I got to see how a big company worked. Not a big company, but how a company worked. And uh, I think the employees were under 100 at that time. Uh, and uh, I saw the business of, of a time sheets and punch cards when you came to work and and how some people uh, didn't do a good job and others did and it was an interesting experience all around and Arthur Collins all took a kind of a liking to me and he invited me out to his home several times and I got to meet his family and uh, and this sort of thing went on then after I'd been there a year I decided to go back to Cornell and uh, uh, he he uh, uh, encouraged me to do that. He said he thought I should get a, a certainly get a bachelor's degree, and so I went back to Cornell. And then I majored in math and physics at Cornell. And the, one of the people who did me a lot of good in my early life was the professor of mathematics there called Elmer Moots. 
And um, Elmer Mutz uh, took an interest in me and, and said, you've, you've got to learn mathematics as well as you can because it's going to be very useful in, if you're going into radio, and, which I was talking about in later life. And then another thing I did at Cornell, the speech department professor was talking with me. Now, remember, I'm a student at Cornell, and uh, was talking with me, and he said, uh, you know, I'd like to record the voices of my speech students. And uh, so I don't know whether he suggested or whether I looked it up, but we found a, a, a recording machine that recorded on aluminum discs. And this, this uh, recording head was pulled across by, a, by a, a screw, as we called it. And the, the needle was, uh, was a diamond or something. And it would, it, as the thing rotated, it would make the grooves on the disc. And it's on a on an aluminum disc, so to play it back, you had to use fiber needles, and so uh, I got figuring with him. We charged the students a dollar uh, for a six-inch record that I could sell them for a dollar a record, and then each student would get two a year, and I could afford to buy the equipment and and sell these records to the students, and this pleased the speech department head. And so for a year, I did. Uh, recordings for the uh, speech department. And then after that, I got busy with other things, and another student took on that recording. Uh, now, then my radio business was, was, was both ups and downs. Sometimes it was good, and other times it wasn't. And I decided, sort of in my beginning of my senior year, that uh, I was going to uh, really uh, put more effort into wiring homes because the rural electrification program uh, by the federal government came into existence and they were underwriting the wiring of homes and the, and the under, underwriting electrical companies uh, putting in new lines into the farms around. And so I advertised in the newspaper, we'll wire homes for you. And so I got a quite a few wiring jobs. And in fact, Cornell College then, seeing that I was able to do this, had me wire an addition they put on to one of their dining room halls. And then they had a, a whole complex of two houses they put together and built a connecting link between them called the Rood House, R-O-O-D. And uh, they wanted new wiring put in that house. And so they gave me the job of rewiring the whole house. And then I got another idea, and that was they were building a new uh, student dormitory, a men's dormitory. And uh, I said, well, you know, uh, the radios we have today uh, really need an antenna. They don't work very well without an antenna. And you're going to have students in all these rooms now, and they all want to have radios. And what are you going to do uh, to give them uh, some way of, of making those radios work? I says, why don't you, and I'd been reading in the magazines, why don't you buy a master antenna system and, that, and then run wires to every room, and then the students can plug in there their radio into this uh, plug on the wall, and they'll have that an antenna, and they'll have first-class reception on their radios. They thought that was a great idea, and I, of course, uh, before I talked to him on this, I looked up how it's done and what it would cost, and so I said, well, look, I'll furnish this whole thing for you for, I forget how much it was, $380 or something, to wire a whole house, a whole place. So they had uh, the electrical people put in the conduits. So all I had to do was push the wires down through the conduits to each room. And they, they, then there was a little amplifier in the attic, and then that went up to an antenna on the roof. And so the antenna on the roof would go to the attic, to go into the attic and go to the amplifier, and the amplifier would send a signal to all the rooms. And I got that finished just before I finished Cornell to go Actually, I would say there that summer uh, be, to, before going east. And you then, were quite the entrepreneur. Well, I was busy. <laughs> now, some people said that I must not got much out of college because I seemed to be doing everything else in that period. Actually, my studying, I studied every morning in the library. 
and I went there because I wanted absolute quiet. And I didn't, then I'd go to classes during the day. And then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I would go to my business. Uh, and I then eventually had, in my senior year, had two people working for me. So we were wiring houses, and, and uh, we, were, we were working together. And they would work in the daytime when I wasn't around, and I would come around about 3 o'clock and join them in whatever was going on. Now, this leads me to the, the summer between my junior and senior year. I was at, Cor at uh, Collins Radio, but I tended to come back to Cornell sort of on weekends sometimes, and, and uh, there was a dentist there and his wife who lived in the house and were very interested in me for some reason, and I would go back that summer and I would just stay at their house. I didn't have a room or anything at, at Cornell during the summertime. And so, so I came back this one day in August, and uh, I think I got down there Friday night, and I slept overnight at the, at the uh, dentist's house. And then the next morning, I went to the library at Cornell, and I decided to read some technical magazines that were there. And there were magazines that were called like Radio News, and and the Proceedings Institute of Radio Engineers and that kind of thing were in the, in the library there. And I was reading those over. And then I went out and got lunch at noon. And, what, and remember it now, I told you the big highway from east-west was going right through Mount Vernon. I was coming back from lunch going uh, down this street. And here was a car, a Cadillac, Massachusetts plates on it, standing with a flat tire. And uh, the guy out there looking at it, he apparently just happened. He got out and he was looking at it in kind of a sad way, a fellow who was probably 55 years old or something like that. And uh, uh, I stopped and I says, well, could I help you? Well, he says, you sure could. And so I, I was dressed in jeans or something. I was not very fancily dressed. And uh, he, uh, he, he opened the trunk and we... I got the the dirty tire out and jacked the got the jack out and jacked the wheels up and of course had to change the tire then put on the spare from the trunk and uh, we got talking then and uh, he said what do you do well I go to this college up here called Cornell of Iowa I'm in Cedar Rapids right now working for a company called the Collins Radio Company he says oh that's my business radio and. Uh, so immediately, we had something at least in common. And then we talked some more, and he said, well, what, what, what's, your, what's your plans? And I said, well, when I get through with my senior year, I'd like to go to graduate school. Professor Moots, my math professor, says that I really ought to think about graduate school. And so I am thinking about this. And he said, well, uh, uh, how are you going to do this? And I'm going to, but I said, I've got to have scholarship money. I just don't have money to uh, my family. It doesn't have money because of the Depression practically wrecked them. And my father had big debts that, that came from his uh, previous life on the farm in Iowa. And uh, the result was that, that I said, I'm going to have to apply for scholarships, the University of Iowa, the University of Illinois, and the University of Minnesota. And, and, and so on, and someplace maybe I'll get a scholarship. He says, well, you ever thought about Harvard? I says, well, Harvard, that's for rich students, the rich man's school. He says, they got more scholarship money than any of these places you've named. He said, look, uh, how are your grades? And we talked about my grades, and he says, look, I'll tell you, uh, let me get in the car. And he came out and got a pad, and he says, I'm going to write down the names of two people that you write to one at Harvard, and one of them is, uh, is, will be the person that will be in charge of giving you the, the blanks to fill out for a scholarship, and the other one will be uh, admission papers. So, and he said, now when you send these things in finally, and you'll have your references, use me as one of your references. And so, uh, this is what I, I did then. Another incidence of great timing. <laughs> Impossible to believe. And then it turns out that he had been a assistant professor at Harvard. 
and he'd gone off and set up a company in Winchester called the Browning Laboratories, and his name was Glenn Browning. And uh, uh, the other thing that happened in this uh, automobile thing, I forgot to tell you. Uh, uh, he asked me my name, and I told him, I said, well, what's your name? He said, my name's Glenn Browning. I said, you're Glenn Browning? I was in the library this morning and read one of your papers in the, in the radio news. Well, I really had a friend then, and that's why he was so good to say he'll be a reference for me then, I think. And so uh, then came the, uh, I did make all these applications to other universities and to Harvard, and I had my professors be references and put his name down as a reference. And uh, then came a, a sort of first of May and, and all the letters coming in from the schools. Every one of them turned me down except from Harvard, which gave me a full scholarship for the year. And so I was off to Harvard. Now I'd saved a little money again because I'd worked for Collins and I'd also done this wearing I told you about. And so I forget exactly how much I had, but I had enough money I thought I could just scrape through with a full scholarship to pay a room and board at, uh, in Cambridge. And uh, this, uh, uh, this sort of is a separation now between Cornell of Iowa and, and Cambridge. Uh, do you have any questions? Um, no, I, I, I'm, you're, you're very nicely going through a whole list of my questions. Um, I think that I'd like to hear a little bit about, um, and I know we have a lot to cover, a little bit about study at Harvard and maybe an, um, some perspective on the difference between Harvard and MIT. Well, of course, I was at Harvard quite a while. <clears throat> I arrived there in 1936 after my graduation at Cornell. And um, the uh, first year, I took four courses. And these, these were courses now really in electrical engineering because the school I applied to was the what was called uh, Engineering and Applied Physics in those days. They don't have that same title now. They have an engineering school now. And I think they also have an Applied Physics uh, department still. But these were kind of grouped together. And this uh, laboratory I went to was called the Cruft Laboratory, C-R-U-F-T. And the Cruft Laboratory had been set up sort of in the early days of radio at Harvard. Uh, they worked with Marconi. And uh, they had all the, some of the equipment that would be used at that time in this early uh, transatlantic broadcasting in the, uh, at the Cruft Laboratory. And the professors there, uh, different ages, uh, some were younger and some were older, were uh, the older ones had really known Marconi. And because he did his first broadcast from Cape Cod, uh, Wellfleet actually across to England. And those were the first transatlantic broadcasts that ever took place. They were code, of course. They were not voice. Uh, they were code uh, signals that were sent across. And so now I was studying in this uh, really quite famous radio uh, educational thing at Harvard. And uh, uh, so, so I worked very hard on those four courses. I figured I was coming out of a... a a small <laughs> school in the Midwest coming up with these big boys at Harvard who came in with all these wonderful grades and backgrounds and so on. Some have been undergraduates at Harvard too. And uh, I was not going to let them beat me out. And so I really studied all the time. I didn't go back to Iowa for Christmas vacation. I just studied right through. And then Harvard had a month called reading period the month of January. And uh, the, the exams then occurred uh, in, the, in the, well, maybe in the last week of January were the exams, or maybe the first week in February, I don't remember. But anyway, I set aside a week for each of my four courses, and I really reviewed everything that they'd taught me, 
Then I went to the library and they already had copies of previous examinations of each of these courses. Harvard had kept those. So I went over all the previous exams to see what those professors were asking. And when the exams were through, I came out with, uh, with three A's and one B plus at the end of my first semester. At the end of my second semester, I had three A's and one A plus. So uh, I even did, did better. And so I came out of that first year looking pretty good. But I had trouble in that year with finances. I found um, at the, uh, after being there a month in the month of uh, September at uh, Harvard, uh, the, uh, I was not going to have enough money if I was going to eat on a dollar a day, which is what I was able to do. And I decided I have to cut down on two me go down to two meals a day and spend no more than 50 cents a day if I was going to get through with the money I had. Now, 50 cents a day, you could get breakfast, you could get a coffee and, a, and a, a, usually some kind of an egg and toast and a small glass of orange juice. And for no noon meal, and at night, my they had what they called the blue plates in the local restaurants and you would get a piece of meat and potatoes and some vegetables and there was, you, I could get a glass of milk with it and a, maybe a, a dessert like a piece of pie and so on. That cost me about 35 cents. So for 50 cents a day, I ate for one year. I lost weight, but uh, I got through that year. Now, uh, this of course, uh, 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 this course brought up question of what's going to happen the second year. Well, anyhow, Glenn Browning then, I kept in contact with him after I got here. And Glenn Browning had been a, a vital part in my getting to Harvard. They talked to him. And he said, well, this fellow looks pretty good. Why don't you take him? And, and so he was, he was in, instrumental in my getting the full scholarship at Harvard. And so I kept in touch with him. He lived in Winchester and had this company. And uh, he had two daughters who were young. They were, I think the oldest one was maybe 11 years old then or something. And the other was about seven or eight or 10. And uh, uh, the older one of the two daughters, just in the last month, I've gotten a long letter from her telling me what, what she'd been doing all these years. And she'd heard about me through my memoir book. And so she uh, she had written to me. Anyhow, that, that that Browning connection kept on. And then he said, "I'll give you a job through the summer between the fresh, between my first year at graduate school and my second year at graduate school. In the summer, uh, I'll give you a job uh, that summer, which he did. And so I earned a little money that summer. But still, it wasn't enough really to take me through the next year. And I was quite worried about this." And you might say, well, why don't you borrow money? But in those days, the students were not accustomed to borrowing money. Uh, I did eventually borrow $100 to get through the, that year. But, uh, but uh, that was not, not very common. Today, of course, people run, students run these big bills today. We wouldn't have thought of that in those days. Well, anyhow. Um, I, I, I was working that summer, and I went back one Saturday to the Cruft Laboratory, and uh, I was, didn't work at this job he had on Saturdays. Went back there on a Saturday, and one of the of the uh, of the uh, business people in the laboratory said, that "Professor Hunt wants to see you." Well, I wondered why would Professor Hunt want to see me? I, I knew he was there because. He was one of the professors. He was not a professor in one of my courses, but he was there. And his specialty was acoustics. And uh, uh, he was a, a fellow who was, I, I forget his exact age, but he was not very old. He was not over 35. And um, he uh, was a very vigorous fellow. He walked around always, was always ready to catch a bus, I always said. He was always walking very fast. and. Uh, so I said, well, is he here? Yes, he happens to be here today. And why don't you go back and see him? And I knew his office in the back of the Cruft Laboratory on the main floor. So I walked back there and walked in and said, I'm Leo Bronick. Oh, yes, he says, I've been wanting to talk to you. He says, I have the 
I'm, for the first time as a professor, I received a grant from the, uh, from the bursar's office at Harvard uh, w by which I can hire an assistant. And he says, I've been looking over the students that I might hire as an assistant, and I also talk with a couple of your professors that you took courses on, and your record is very good. I wonder if you'd consider being an assistant to me. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you could take two courses instead of four, and you'd work half time for me, and I'll pay you, I think it was $800 for the academic year. And uh, I, I, he says, I wonder if you'd think about that. And I says, well, Professor Hunt, I don't, I don't have to think very long. <laughs> I says, I really need financial help to get through my next school year and I would love to work for you, and I'll do the best I can. And he then said, uh, well, now, uh, I'll be back in a month, and, uh, and uh, in the meantime, I'll set it up so that you start getting pay the 1st of September. And so the middle of September, he got back, and then we, we made a planning for the first year. And of course, I took my two courses through that year, and uh, then, uh, Hunt says, now what we're going to do, I want to develop a lightweight phonograph pickup. The reason for that is that during Harvard's uh, tricentennial, uh, their 300th anniversary, uh, uh, we, re we recorded all the main events there, including Franklin Roosevelt's speech and others. Um, we recorded all these, but we did them on vinyl discs. And that meant we, we had to record a cut little sliver of stuff that went off on the floor, made, the, made embossed into the thing by cutting actual material out. But there's no way to play these records back because all the standard pickups weigh too much. They're, they're made to play on these, these uh, three, three minute uh, discs that we have. And they Are have- those a, 78s? 78s, that's right. And they had a metal needle in the in the pickups, and the pickups were heavy, and you could play on those shellac discs they were. And, uh, but he says, we can't play our vinyl disc with those because they would just tear them up. We gotta have a lightweight pickup. So he says, I wanna develop this year a lightweight pickup. And so, now he said, look, there's several things. I'm gonna give you, we're, we're gonna set a laboratory up for this project upstairs. They give me a room for it. And I've also arranged for you to have a room next to it as your room, your own private place. And I want you to put in half your time. And first thing I want you to do is to, is to build a loudspeaker that will play low notes. We have a speaker that will play high notes, but we don't have one to play the lowest notes. And so he says, I'll get, help you with, the, with acoustics knowledge, but you're going to have to put the whole thing together and work it out with the machine, the carpenter shops on how to build the thing and so on. So I built a loudspeaker that was probably about uh, five feet wide and, and maybe five feet high and six feet deep and had uh, two big louds, two big cone loudspeakers in it. And with that trumpet we made with this wood I put up, we could get big bass notes out of the thing. It was fantastically successful. And so then we used the high frequency part they already had, which we put on top of it. And then as he worked on these successive models of these lightweight pickups, then we'd play them back through the through this loudspeaker. And he said the reason he wanted the big loudspeaker was he wanted to be sure that any pickup he developed would cover a wide range of, of frequencies and sound good. Well, uh, of course, what happened was we found that his early models, very lightweight pickups, had a ring to them, sort of a tinny sound to them. And so they had, those had to be dampened by putting in some kind of damping material on them. And then he would make a little design and say, give it to me and says, take it down to the machine shop and talk with the machinists and get this thing changed. And when they get it finished, bring it back up and we'll test it. And of course, uh, then I, I uh, then he said, we also got to build a, a better amplifier for this loudspeaker system because we can't buy a good, uh, good amplifier. 
And so uh, I had to design an amplifier, which was also interesting. And uh, I was finding this a very good way to learn a lot of things, of course. And he was good at, at uh, telling me what to do and getting me to express my own feelings as we went along. I started to get to know something about what was going on. By the end of the year, he developed a really a very high-grade, lightweight pickup that you could use on vinyl records without damaging them. This then became the front page of one of the radio magazines, a new lightweight pickup, and that then was the thing that made possible the 33 and a third and the 45 uh, records, RPM records. Uh, they did not use his pickup. He tried to sell it to various companies, but what happened was he did not visualize that there was a hi-fi market. He tried to sell it to people like Wurlitzer who made uh, uh, phonograph playback things for, for restaurants and, and bars and things like that. But they said, we don't really need this because we don't mind wearing our records out. And we just put more in because there are always new ones coming out all the time, so it's no problem. So he never was able to sell this. He hadn't visualized a hi-fi market. But uh, one of the companies, see, I forgot its name right now, uh, had uh, decided to try and put out pickups and advertise them for people who might want to play them in their homes, so-called hi-fi market. And they would sell turntable and sell a lightweight pickup. Well, they pretty much copied his pickup. But uh, they were able to do just enough difference so the patents weren't a big problem. And you couldn't patent the basic principle in it because the basic principle was simply a moving coil in a magnetic field. And that was uh, been patented 100 years, I mean, many years before. And um, he, uh, uh, so he never got any money out of this, really. But he did get the reputation of having built the first pickup that would make possible later the 33 and the third and the 45 records. And of course the 33 and the records then went how long? Uh, oh, um, they, they must have 20, 25 minutes. 20, 25 minutes. In my book, I've forgotten the time now. It was a long time compared to the old threes. And uh, this, uh, this was a big change. So we got through that year and, and uh, and I stayed with him another year as his half-time assistant. And that year, then, we went into studying acoustics in rooms, which was quite different. And, of course, it expanded my knowledge of acoustics. And, of course, I never thought about being an acoustics person. I, my plan was to go into radio. But now I'm working for him, so that's what I'm learning. And so the second year, uh, he said, now, there's been a new book. And, a new book has come out. In fact, I didn't tell you that during the first year I was with him, I also took his course that he was teaching in acoustics. And his course in acoustics, he used a new book that had just come out from a professor at MIT called Philip Morse, M-O-R-S-E. And Philip Morse was, was a, a theoretical mathematician who decided to spend a year or two in the field of acoustics because he thought that there were things that he could do mathematically in that field that had never been done before. And he brought this book out. And uh, so we, uh, Hunt used that book in his course, and I was taking that course, so I studied Morse's book then, as I, along with, with uh, Hunt's teachings. And uh, that was my first year with Hunt. And the second year, he said, now look, we, there's a lot of things in Morse's book that you and I have studied. But there's not much data. It's all sort of theoretical work. We really ought to make some measurements to see how true that, that theory is. Uh, Morse had not done any experiments. He just published it all as theoretical work. And um, so then we planned to set up experiments to, to study the theoretical work. And these were now small rooms that we set up at the first off because the theory was for any size of room. And we decided to study small rooms because we could, we could change the dimensions of a small room. And, uh, and we could put materials on different surfaces. It didn't take much acoustical material. And it was all much simpler than trying to work with real rooms. 
And so we made studies in these small rooms, and then at the end of the, that second year, Hunt, uh, uh, let me just think a little bit on this. Hunt, Hunt published a paper, yes, he published a paper in which he, it's probably halfway through that year, he published a paper in which he acknowledged that I'd been his assistant on it. Is this the paper, uh, the design of speech communication systems? No. No, that no. was yours. That's way later, okay. much later. Uh, this now is still back in 1938, 39 in that region. And he, he Acknowledge in the and the acknowledgments at the end that I'd been his assistant and taken a lot of the data, and then we decided. I guess it was the second semester we decided to do a full room experiments, and I worked on the full room experiments. Then we got a joint paper out which had my name. And there was a Chinese student, Da Yu Ma, who was also getting his doctorate, and he did some of the theoretical work for this paper and me, and the three of us then were co-authors on a paper that dealt with room acoustics. And that was my first paper, really, that meant something in the field of acoustics. And it's still referred to often as a Hunt, Brunick, and Ma paper. And then, by this time now, I was, remember, in my uh, first, second year, I was, let's see, I, got, I got, came in 36 and got my degree in 40, so that would have been four years then. So in my third year, which is my second year with him, I had half time on my own, and by then I didn't need to take any more courses. So I was now working on my doctoral, potential doctoral uh, thesis. And uh, uh, I decided on what I'm going to do for my doctoral thesis, and uh, I had passed the qualifying exam. You have an oral qualifying exam to prove that you're going to be a candidate for the doctorate. And uh, uh, then uh, I'd, I went to, the, uh, to, to Professor Chaffee, who was the head of the Kreft Laboratory, and asked him if I could get a uh, machine shop help to set up the equipment I needed. And I wanted to start measuring something I called acoustic impedance. Now the reason for doing this again was Morse's book was heavily involved with using the concept of acoustic impedance, but nobody had ever measured it. It was all theory. And so I had set up an experiment that would measure acoustic impedance of materials. And these are materials like you'd use in a, in a room, uh, Celotex or whatever companies, things you find these tiles, things. Those, determine what the acoustic impedance was on. The acoustic impedance is a measure of how sound behaves inside the materials, and then you could better judge how you might redesign a material to make it absorb sound better, because you might understand better what's going on inside. And so I then set this equipment up and had it going. Now, what am I going to do now at the end of working for him for two years? And gee, again, one of these very queer coincidences, I got a call from a Professor Burkhard. I think the call came in about uh, April, something like that. It's in my book. And um, uh, he said, uh, first, are you Leo Bronick? And I said, yes. And he said, well, uh, we decided to give you one of the Harvard's top scholarships. And he said, this scholarship will let you be full time on here, or if you want to go to Europe to study, it'll cover your study in Europe. And if you go to Europe, we'll pay your transportation. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll get a letter from the president of Harvard saying that this is one of their top scholarships, that they should give you all kinds of good recognition if you appear anywhere, uh, that this school is, is fully behind you. And this will pay you uh, something like, uh, see, I was getting for Hunt about, uh, I think it was $800 a year, and this is going to pay me about $1,600, about double. And, uh, and, and I didn't have to work. <laughs> it was completely free money. And so then I really got down to work on my doctor's thesis. But 
I thought about going to Europe, but the only place in Europe acoustics was taught was in, was in Germany. It, the war was starting, the Hitler War. That wasn't good timing. And so I said, there's no way I can go over there. And uh, so I decided that I would stay at Harvard and work for my doctorate just full time at Harvard. And I cleared that with the, with the dean's office to make sure that, that uh, it was all right that I didn't go to Europe. And uh, uh, so I then was able to plow into this work full time, night and day, working toward getting a doctorate. But now remember, this is only the, uh, in, in some ways, only the third year because I was working half time for Hunt. But I was only in my fourth year there at, at Harvard. And uh, to get your doctorate in that short a time was not too promising because they like to have you work longer. And in fact, Hunt was not very encouraging. He said, I think you're going to have to spend another year. And he told me this in about, uh, I would say, December uh, of my fourth year there. And uh, uh, I said, well, I'm going to really try hard to get my doctorate this spring because there's a war starting. And I said, I don't want to get in a situation where I, I don't get my doctorate because I have to go off to war. There's uh, drafts were coming in. The, the, the Congress had voting a draft and this kind of thing. And I didn't know what I'd be in the military. And so I really got down to work, uh, just night and day, slept as little as possible, just tried to get that thesis done. And then I, there was a, a, a woman, a secretary uh, in the, uh, applied physics department who said she would type my thesis for me, which she did. And uh, I, I had some help from uh, a photographer there in the department to take pictures of my equipment and all. And so I started putting this thesis together in, I would say, starting about in March. And then I went over to Hunt and I said, look, now I've got this much done and here's some graphs and my findings and all. And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, you can try. He said, but you're going to have to get through a committee. The, we're gonna, I, he said, I'll see the committee is appointed now that when you hand in your thesis, there'll be a thesis committee. And if you pass your thesis, that's OK. But he says, I can't guarantee with the amount of work that you've done whether they'll approve it or not. Now, that was along in December. And of course, I worked hard up until March. And then by March, I was. Uh, well, I guess I'd talked to him in March finally. I then put this whole thing together. And by the 1st of, first of May or something, or middle of May, I had this, yes, I think the 1st of May, I had it ready, or roughly then, to give to the thesis committee. And they came back and said that uh, in two weeks afterwards that, that I had passed my thesis uh, ex inspection. And then the, the rules of Harvard were there'd be an oral defense of thesis examination. And uh, this usually is done before the thesis committee. And they will then, they, they've read your thesis, but now they're going to examine you to see if, if you really know what you've got in the thesis. And uh, so Hunt now wanted to protect himself. This, I was his first graduate student. And so he appointed the best committee he could he could find. He got uh, he got one that professor got a Nobel Prize, and he got Chaffee, who was the head of the laboratories, and he got a fellow named G.W. Pierce, who was one of the famous acousticians, older men of that time, and then Hunt. There were four of them. And it came to my thesis day, and normally just the committee examines you, but there is a rule at Harvard that the things can be open to the public. And one of my pals that I developed in, in graduate school there, Robert Watson, decided to, to pull a little trick on me. So he passed the word around, why don't we all go to, to Bronick's defense of thesis? And so he drummed up over 100 people to go to my defense of thesis thing. And they had to move it from a room into an auditorium when he told them there was going to be 100 people there. And it became quite a, quite a circus almost. And uh, so I 
gave a story about my thesis and what my basic th thoughts were and what future work would have to be done. And then the, the head of the, of the committee was chaffy and he turned to the audience and said, now we can take questions from the audience first and then there'll be questions from the thesis committee. Well, there were some, some interesting questions from the audience, but they were all answerable. And then we got into the examination by the thesis committee. And uh, uh, one of them, I forget which one, it was Chaffee or, or, or uh, what's his name, Van, Van Vleck, who was the Nobel Prize winner, Professor Van Vleck. Van Vleck, one of them said, well, why don't you do a simple thing for us? Uh, assume that a, a acoustic wave is being sent through air from one point to another. And while it goes by you, tell us how the power varies as it goes by you, the acoustic power. So I'd never done this. So I set up the mathematics and put it out. And I says, well, it's interesting. The power goes by like sausages. It, it doesn't flow smoothly as you radiate sound. And that's what my mathematics showed. And the, the other, they, they thesis committee said, we've never seen that before. And I said, well, I haven't either. Why don't we just call this session off and we're going to, professors, we're going to go and talk about what you showed us and see if we think it's true or not. And so they, they left me and, and they came back later and said I passed and presumably they thought what I did was right. And so that got me my doctorate. The big, the big thing that happened, I wrote two papers in June already, submitted them to the Acoustical Society and they published them, of all things, in July. Incredible. Today it would take at least 10 months to get a paper published. And I sent them in, they published them right away. And Professor Morris at MIT read those papers and was very interested. And so he uh, and some uh, two of his students published a paper very soon after that. And then he became one of my closest friends, and he even wrote me a letter and said he'd like to do some research jointly with me. He'd do the theory and I'd do the experimentation. And then along in November, he called and said that the National Defense Research Committee, which later became the Office of Scientific Research and Development, has been set up by the president to do civilian research related to the military effort. and. Uh, he said they, they, the first laboratory they set up is the Radiation Laboratory at MIT. And we just got a request in. Uh, he said that I've been called by the president of MIT, who was Carl Compton, and Carl Compton was on the, was on the NDRC board. And Compton says, we got a request from the military to do something about noise and bombers. And uh, he wanted to ask Morse if Morse would be willing to take on this project. And Morse said yes. And then called me and said, this work is close to what you've done in your thesis. Uh, would you be my assistant? Would you come down to MIT? And so I said, yes, I sure would. I'd like to work with you. And I already have my doctorate. Now, this was after my doctorate. This is now in, in November of this, uh, 1940. And uh, uh, then I told Hunt, and Hunt blew his stack and says, nothing doing. He says, they've got the radiation laboratory at MIT, and they can't have every laboratory that comes in. Furthermore, you're a Harvard man, and this work should be done at Harvard, and I, Hunt, should supervise it, and you be my ex ex assistant, he said, not Morse. And so I said, well, I've told Morse I'm going down there with him. And he said, well, I'm going down and talk to Compton. So he goes down and talks to Compton. He said, I just think it's the wrong thing for MIT to have all these things. And Compton called Morris, and Morris said, well, you've already given me the job, and I don't intend to give it up. And Bronick said, he's coming with me. And so then Compton, realizing he had two people who were going to give him trouble, so he called them in and says, well, plague on both of your houses. We'll let Bronick run the project. Well, now. This is now a project which uh, I didn't even have any idea how, how big it was going to be or much about it. And they said, well, to supervise you, we'll set up a supervisory committee with Morse as chairman and Hunt as vice chairman. 
and they will they will uh, sort of look after what you're doing, but the project's going to be yours. So I met with Morris, and Morris says, well, you've got to get a budget together. And we're going to have to have a meeting in New York with the uh, with the uh, with the, some acoustics people there, and the military will have to ask in. We'll talk about what they want, really. And so uh, the meeting was set up in New York, and the military, the, the Air Force people came. In fact, they were called the Air Corps in those days. The Air Corps people came, and there was a, they got Harvey Fletcher, who was head of physics research at the Bell Labs, to come over, and there were some other uh, acoustics people of importance there. And they asked me what, what I wanted. Well, I said, it seems to me what they're asking for is a new acoustical material. And they want it to be lightweight, highly absorbent, and be fireproof. And there's nothing on the market like that today. It has to be a new invention. And I says, I could probably develop this in a year, and I'll need an assistant, and I'll need some laboratory money, and some shop money, and some equipment. And let's say, uh, Harvard has told me that they'll pay my salary, so I don't even have to charge you for my salary. And they didn't, wouldn't want any overhead for this job. Uh, they, and so I said, I, I think I need about $4,000. There was quiet in the room, and then the Air Force man stood up and said, look, this is ridiculous. We want this job to move, and it's going to have to move fast. And it was not going to be possible for you to dwaddle along over a year and invent a material. I'm saying that we're going to to 10 times the money and you're going to have to spend it in a half a year. And we will then appropriate even a full year for you, but that'll be about $80,000. And this was 4,000 I was asking for. Well, I never thought of spending that amount of money. And so I got back to Harvard. I then had to figure out how to do this. I had to hire people to work for me because now this is going to have to move. And so I set up a laboratory that grew, grew in the next couple of years to 100 people. And uh, our first job was to find a new material to put into airplanes that would be fireproof and absorb sound better than everything else because the complaint was that the noise was so great in the pilot's compartment and even in the compartments where there were gunnery people uh, that uh, they they got fatigued, and it was very difficult to communicate. They found that if you went above about 30,000 feet, their communication equipment didn't work well because something, the equipment got weak and the noise stayed loud, and you'd end up not being able to use the voice communication equipment. And they, everybody had to wear oxygen masks in those days. Nothing was pressurized. So they had to always talk through the oxygen masks to each other. And uh, so then I built this laboratory, and, and uh, there's a description of all the things that went on that year in my book. And what we did, we developed a new acoustical material, but the project changed. It, it changed in as much as the military decided we really wanted to improve our communication equipment we, because it's got to it's gotta be able to handle this noise. It isn't just a matter of bringing the noise down some. It's still going to be too loud. The equipment has to be better. And so immediately we went into a study of this equipment and found that, uh, that uh, the earphones were the biggest problem. They were not suited to work at high altitude. The human voice got weak at high altitude. Uh, and uh, uh, the microphones in the oxygen mass were not very good. They ought to be better microphones. And so we put through all these changes. Within a year, we had new earphones coming out. And uh, uh, we made a major difference in speech communication in uh, military uh, planes in World War II. And this was all done before pressurizing. Because after pressurizing, you could pretty much do as you did in your living room. You could talk. Uh, and it was not that much trouble, but we got it so everything worked with the equipment then we had to use. Uh, then, uh, at the, as, as about it's 1940 when this started, by 1943, uh, the uh, kamikazes were coming 
into existence. And it was decided that they had to do some studying of how to improve the combat information centers on ships. And the Naval Research Laboratory had decided that because my work had been so successful up until then, why didn't I take on starting a new laboratory to investigate how to fight the kamikaze threat? And that led to my setting up a systems research laboratory, which was a ship on, on land down at the, uh, in the, uh, Jamestown, Rhode Island. There's an island there, I forget, Connecticut Island or something, and the tip of it's called Beaver Tail. And, and uh, we, this became the Beaver Tail facility then. It's a new building we set up, even a ship on land. And in the book, there's a big lot of story about the difficulties of, of getting the equipment there because the Navy's regulations where you couldn't put in modern shipboard equipment on land that had to go on the ships. So they had to commission my laboratory a ship in the United States Navy, even though it was, built, it was a building. <laughs> and so in effect, I became the captain of a, of a ship in the United States Navy, though they didn't call me captain. Now, in all of this, Morse, Professor Morris at MIT and Hunt were still the supervisory committee for my work, so that I was in constant contact with Morris. And when the uh, war was over, uh, I was then looking for a job permanently. And uh, I actually stayed at Harvard uh, that uh, I, I took a job as assistant professor that that year at Harvard after the war, 1940, when the war was over, and uh, 1940, 1945, when the war was over, sorry. And uh, uh, Morse then talked to Compton and says, why don't we get me to come down as a <clears throat> associate professor at uh, MIT? And so, I was now also very seriously considering a full professorship at the University of Notre Dame. And I hadn't even thought about something possibility at, at MIT. And I got this call from Professor, uh, from uh, President Compton, Carl Compton, to come to MIT and talk to him about becoming an associate professor there. So I did. And I had discussion with him about uh, about the job, and I had been given this offer at Notre Dame where I was to have a whole laboratory to myself, or at MIT they already had set up an acoustics laboratory, and Richard Bolt was the uh, director of it, and uh, I'd be coming in without any title really, just as associate professor. Well, Compton thought of it and says, well, we'll make you the technical director and make him the administrative director. So you'll have two directors in the lab. And uh, he said, well, in regard to your salary, you say that they've made you this better offer at, at Notre Dame. And I didn't tell him what the offer was, but he says, we'll do better than I told you already on your salary because we want, really want you here. And then Compton did an interesting thing. He says, now, I don't want to be accused of being a liar, so I'm going to call in my secretary and dictate to her what I've just told you. And that will be a letter that will go to you making this offer formally. He says, he says presidents often are called liars because they dictate something different after the meeting. And we're going to have this be really straightforward. So that's what happened. I got the offer. I called Notre Dame and turned down the... <laughs> job out there, which made them unhappy because they thought I was coming. And uh, I then became, uh, along with Dick Bolt, in the new acoustics library, which had been going only a year, he was director of it, and I was a technical director. And so whatever that meant, we worked together jointly to make this thing work. That was the first time you worked together. That's right, first time we worked together. Now, I'd met Dick Bolt at acoustical meetings before then, and he was a very personable young man. And in fact, we got along exceedingly well in this, this new laboratory. Now then, L I let me let me Let me ask a question before we, we go on. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about the differences between Harvard and MIT? I certainly can. So I came then to MIT 1947, I think it was, in the fall. I think that's right. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, of course, I went to the electrical engineering department, and Harold Hazen was the chairman of the electrical engineering department. The electrical engineering department at MIT was a standard double E department with big machinery. They emphasized big motors and big generators and electric power generation. Uh, and this was the sort of thing that had been taught for a number of years, even before the war. And uh, so um, Hazen said, we're going to put this acoustics course in. It's kind of a new kind of course. And why don't you teach the acoustics course? And also, we'd like to have you do some other teaching. And uh, I uh, decided I would like to be a, a, a co-teacher, a, a sort of a sub-teacher, you might say, with Ernie Gilliman, who was teaching uh, circuit theory of a new kind, different kind of thing than been taught ever before at MIT or anywhere else. And he wanted some new assistants to work with him on this course. And so he had a couple of us join with him, and I was one of those. And uh, I met with his students part of the time, and he would meet with them part of the time. And uh, this was a very good year for me because I got to learn a lot of new things that I didn't get at Harvard in the courses on circuit theory, and neither did anybody else in the field, of course, because this was all new work. At the end of that first year, Gordon Brown was brought in as chairman of the uh, electrical engineering department. And Gordon Brown says, we're going to change this whole thing. We want to throw out all this big heavy machinery. We're going to bring in servo mechanisms, all modern smaller equipment. And uh, uh, this is going to be a complete change, but we got to make this work. And he came to me and said, now you have already been doing some interesting new things. I want you to work with me in setting up this this new curriculum. Well, then Dick Bolt got word that he'd asked him, and Dick Bolt went to President, who was, I think, Killian probably by then, and said, look, we hired him in acoustics, and they want to put him in electrical engineering. And he says, I strongly object to this. And so uh, Killian told Brown to stop using me, that I had to stay in acoustics. That's what they'd hired me for. So, I, however, I did stay and take on teaching assignments in the electrical engineering department, new courses. Now, this course change was very drastic. It was a way of teaching electrical engineering that had never been done anywhere before. And he had a problem because the older professors were objecting to this. And so he says, look, I'm going to make a rule. You can continue teaching, but you cannot use your textbooks. We're going to have to teach new things. And these professors were appalled because their books were, were the basis for their courses. And, and three or four of them quit, went to other institutions. But that was what played in Gordon Brown's hands because he could hire more young people then to come in as new associate professors. And that's just what happened. He brought in a group of young then professors, and the group of us wrote the textbook sort of like committee those first few years. And this was a complete revolution. Then the, uh, the thing that I found that was so different from Harvard was that you did have an organization here that was strong. You had a president who was strong. You had the department head who was strong. Things could happen. At Harvard, every professor was almost a little uh, potentate in himself. And they said every tub at Harvard sits on its own bottom. And every professor is sort of, once he gets appointed, they can't do much with him. He, he, he's not bossed by anybody. There's not a head of a department. They have a chairman. And the chairman's only there for a couple of years. And they change the chairman. The president can't do anything with these departments, at least not in those days. And uh, the result was that it was a 
uh, sort of let the professors do what they want once you appoint them. And at MIT, you had an organization. It was run more like a corporation. So it was easier to make institutional changes. If you wanted to make big changes, it sure was. You didn't have to plead with these professors to change or whoever was going to do the pleading because they, they sort of had a committee of themselves. And, and how they make a change, I don't know. But at Harvard, you had, I mean, MIT, you had somebody like Brown who could say, we're going to change it. And by gosh, they did. Well, now the accreditation committee came in. The accreditation came in and studied this new course. This is probably at the end of the first year of Brown. And they came in and met with him in his office. And he says, we're not going to accredit MIT in electrical engineering. And Brown rocked back and forth to his chair. And he says, look, don't accredit MIT and look what fools you'll be. They went off and talked the thing over, and they came back and says, we will accredit you. And so MIT then changed the way electrical engineering was taught all over our country, probably the world, but all over our country, because he had the courage to make a drastic change at that time. Now, of course, the change would not have come about except you had the radiation lab during the war down here, which had brought in new ideas and new people, and he was associated part-time with the radiation lab, and he'd done some work during World War II on servo mechanism, to became famous in that field already. And the result was that this new stuff came about in part because of heavy financing from the federal government. And of course, it's the way I learned acoustics in the World War II, uh, all the things I did in the in electroacoustics laboratory and then the system research laboratory were with major government financing. So really, these things were important. When you first got to MIT, do you remember what your first impressions were of colleagues or students or the environment? Well, of course, my first thing I had to do was to meet with uh, Dick Bolt and uh, meet with him in the new acoustics laboratory. He'd only been there a year. He had a, a, they'd been put in a building, which was an old garage building back on the corner of Vassar Street and Main Street. That's been torn down since. Uh, in fact, I think that's part of what is the, is the uh, state of building that's there now. Uh, and um, uh, this building had two floors in it, lots, some nice rooms, and uh, some uh, little auditorium. And it was a very, very good space for acoustics research. And he took me then over and said, look, we'll put your office in this place. We'll have to build your office because this space has never been built up. And if you're happy with that, that's where we'll put you. And this was excellent. And so Bolt and I became good friends, and we worked together very closely. And then uh, he had his doctoral students, which came primarily out of physics. He was a physics professor. My doctoral students came out of electrical engineering because electrical engineering professor. And then later on, we brought Bob Newman in. And Bob Newman was an architectural uh, assistant professor. And then uh, one day in 1948, uh, Dick Bolt called me into his office and said that sometime prior to that, he had uh, Killing and got a request to, for MIT to do some consulting for the United Nations buildings in New York City, acoustic consulting. And he said that uh, he then called in Dick Bolt and said, You'll have to take this on because MIT doesn't do consulting. And so Dick Bolt then put in a proposal that he would be the consultant for the new uh, 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 UN building. It's going up in New York, permanent headquarters building. And then he got the job. His competition was really a professor from UCLA, but the UCLA professor had the travel and his travel costs and extra time flying back and forth. So his proposal was for more money than, than Bolt put in. And he got the job then to do the consulting on the United Nations. What he hadn't expected was that he got a pile of drawings and it was beyond belief how big and how much of them there were saying this is what you got to work with. Bolt looked at these drawings and said, look, this is not one man's job. We, we better 
uh, he'd better get some help. So he called me over and said, Leo, why don't we set up a little company and do this thing together? And we can do other consulting too. And so uh, we talked about that in 1948, and we decided to set up a company which we called Bolt, Bronick, and Newman. And that was the start then of a consulting company. And it was done with Killian's uh, uh, even encouragement. Killian says that MIT doesn't want to be a consulting. There's going to be some other acoustical things. Why don't you set up a little company and you can, uh, you can take off one day a week to run your company and weekends if you want. And, uh, uh, and we, we think probably this is a good thing for both for MIT and for you. And you want you to continue teaching your courses and, and you're handling graduate students. And I had several doctoral students at that time. And in fact, I think I mentioned to you that I had two students, uh, James Flanagan and uh, Kenneth Stevens, doctoral students of mine, who got National, uh, National Medal of Science from the federal government, which is a top honor you can get in the, in the United States in, in science. And those two both got this Medal of Science. So I had a whole group of students who were, did good work, too. And uh, so my feeling about MIT versus Harvard was that it was a darn good place to work. Things got done. And then in the process of it all, we did set up the Bolt, Bronick, and Newman, which became a very successful company. Um, tell me a little bit about how BBN moved from acoustics into computing. Well, that was my doing. I was president of BBN. We incorporated after, I don't know, a uh, couple of years after we uh, uh, first made a partnership. And I was president. Dick Bolt was chairman of the board. And, and then uh, we had uh, uh, Bob Newman was, uh, was a, a vice president. And uh, uh, Jordan Bruch was a treasurer. Jordan Bruch was a doctoral student under me who had gone into acoustics. And uh, uh, we, were, we became very successful in acoustics. In fact, at one time we said it's almost uh, necessary the architects hire you because we're practically the only good acoustics firm in the, in the United States. And uh, so we were, we were we, and the United Nations job had worked out beautifully. We got a fine reputation out of it. And uh, uh, I was thinking about, well, you know, this now a couple of years have gone by in the company, and it seemed to me there's a limit to how much acoustics work there would be. And if we want to really be a successful company and grow, we ought to do something in addition. So I got thinking about a wartime experience where we worked with the Systems Research Laboratory and so on, where I had psychologists as, and time and motion engineers and so on. Why don't we set up a man-machine division? And this will have applied psychologists and maybe time and motion people. And we will try and do things where man can do a better job working with machines. And for example, blind landing of airplanes, I thought of. And I thought of the of the big uh, sailing ship contests that we have, the America Cup things, where there is so much technical work going on. And maybe we can make there be a better, better coupling between men and the machine. And maybe there's enough work like this. Well, then I thought, well, who's going to head this up? Because none of us there, we're acoustics people, are going to be able to do this right. And I got thinking about a fellow who'd worked at Harvard named J.C.R. Licklider, who had gotten a degree, I think his bachelor's degree, in, in physics, and he had become a psychologist. And, and, and in fact, I didn't mention this, but I did get him hired into MIT uh, because I thought that MIT should have an experimental psychologist in the double E department. And so I got talked Gordon Brown into bringing him in. And then Gordon Brown put him on a committee that helped set up the Lincoln Lab, for example. 
And Licklider put in about half his time at the Lincoln Lab and half his time teaching uh, uh, applied psychology. And uh, then at BBN, I was thinking about, well, why don't I get Licklider to leave MIT and come in the BBN and head up this man machine work? And uh, uh, Licklider agreed he'd come. In fact, partly because he was having some trouble at MIT, he'd wanted to set up a psychology department, and MIT decided not to do that. And he wanted really to have a department sort of his own. He didn't want to be just a professor in the double E department. And so I hired him to come in there and be a vice president and take on this man machine work. Well, he'd been there only a short time, and he said, well, we want to buy a digital computer. And I said, well, we've got a punch card IBM computer, and we've got some some analog computers. Why do we need a digital computer? Well, that's the thing of the future. If BBN's going to really progress, make progress, new things, we got to be with digital computers. And I have one that we could buy at a reasonable price for about $30,000. And he said, I've already negotiated that price. And I wonder if BBM will buy a $30,000 computer. Well, I says, look, like we never bought anything more expensive than a drinking fountain before. <laughs> $30,000, what are you going to do with it? He says, I don't know. But he says, I think BBN's got to be in computers. So that's what got us in computers. Once we got that computer, and Licklider then sat down and learned how to program. He spent a lot of time learning programming. And then Digital Equipment Corporation, the people that, set it up, came out of the Lincoln Laboratory, went over there and set up Digital Equipment Corporation. They came out with a computer they called the PDP-1, their first computer. And Ken Olson was the president, and he came over to see me and said, look, we want to have uh, somebody test our machine, this prototype machine we built, the PDP-1. And we need to put it somewhere for a month or so and let somebody run it and see how it goes. And so then he talked with Licklider, who was with me, and decided Licklider really knew something about programming. And so he says, would you guys be willing to take this on? I see that you're, you have the uh, necessary interest to do it. And, and give me a report at the end of a month or so. So they moved the first prototype PDP-1 over and beat Bolt, Ronick, and Newman. We ran it for a month with Licklider, and then he had a couple of young guys he'd hired. And they put it through its uh, paces and sent it back with recommendations. And then we bought the first PDP-1 because it was such a good machine. It changed everything. It now was a, was a digital computer of first quality, not little $30,000 one. It was a, actually a $150,000 one, but it was a first quality machine and did a lot of things. And so that was what started us. Then Licklider started hiring first class people number of those came out of Lincoln Laboratory who already were working on computers at Lincoln Lab. But here was something new and a new group and, and a new computer, and it was kind of a, a good place to think of coming. And we set up a group there that at one time was called by some people around us were the third university in Cambridge because we had a first-class software group that we'd set up. Dick Bolt decided we ought to get somebody even stronger to come over from Lincoln Lab, and he got Frank Hart to come over. Frank Hart was a very senior man at Lincoln Lab in computers. And uh, then Hart started hiring some people. And this got to be a really a strong group. And then the request for proposal came through from the military to develop a new network to hit, connect computers together. And they sent this out to, I don't know, 100 and some different places. 30 of them responded. And of those, the military, the, the, the division of the Department of Defense called the, the uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, had, uh, uh, this, had to decide who was going to get the contract, develop this network. and. It was between us and Raytheon, and we won it. And so we got the, in 1968, at Christmas time, we got the notification from, from ARPA that we'd received the contract. 
And President and uh, Senator Kennedy sent us a telegram congratulating us and saying that we're congratulated on getting the interfaith interfaith message processor contract. It was supposed to be the inner intercomputer, but it got interfaith into the thing. <laughs> so we were going to be a Christian religion job, I guess, but that's not what it was. That was always one of our jokes about the interfaith telegram. Well, anyhow, uh, this telegram, this uh, project required us to do uh, five, uh, make a computer network with five stations on it first. And then if that worked, it would be 19. So the idea was to hook together 19 computers. And these would be located in universities and it's a couple of the government laboratories. And all these universities had IBM computers that cost a million and a half dollars a piece. So what we were doing is hooking together these very expensive computers. And one of the reasons that the, the uh, government wanted to do this, and particularly the ARPA wanted to do this, was that the smaller universities wanted big computers like this. They said, we can't be buying big computers for every university in the United States. But if we make a network, then they can hook into the network and use these big computers, maybe after midnight, when they're not in use in the big schools. So we can share the big computers among more schools this way. Well, we uh, then uh, set up, uh, we, we invented this uh, sort of a cabinet. It was the size of a refrigerator which when you'd bring it into, say, where one of these computers was, that would hook into their computer. And these institutions had different makes of computers. They were IBMs, they were, uh, they were other companies who were making big computers at that time. So there were probably four different ones that were, maybe five, that were in these different companies, different universities. And um, uh, they set this thing up. But this, these, uh, they were set up wherever we put them. These were connected together to form the network. And they would hook their computers into those. And so this became the, the big network, which is like the internet today, only it was just one network and started off with only two people. And uh, the first two went on the air, I think, in 1969, I believe, was the was the year that, uh, that, the, that the first two spoke with each other. And then uh, every month another one computer, one of these things we built and shipped, added to another university. And then about 19 months had gone by, we had 19 of these out, and we had the, the ARPANET busy. Then the government financed the ARPANET as it grew up until 1982 at which time they said, well, look, we think that this can be uh, handled by people like Comcast and was today is Comcast and RCN and, and Fios and so forth. They can harm it, uh, they can handle it, and they can charge people to use it. Whereas uh, we were been paying for the whole thing and nobody's being charged, everybody's getting free use of it. That's the way it was going until 1982. So, they stopped financing it in 1982. Let me ask a question, because um, as you were getting into computers, did you, were you able to see what the future of no. them and was? And the reason we weren't able to see it was computers were big, costly things. The cheapest one you could buy was a deck computer for $150,000. And, and IBM stuff was, was very expensive. Then came the PC. And when the PC came in, now everybody could have a computer. And it grew like mad starting in about 1982, you see. Did you consider yourself a kind of computer geek at no, the time? No. No, I just hired him. I was the president of the company. And I really did was not a computer man, really. Now then, that's one reason, of course, that I, I left BBN. Uh, the can we before we talk about leaving BBN? Can you tell me about the decision about leaving MIT? 
Oh, yes. Well, that was simply that BBN grew so much. It was growing so fast and so much business that first I went from full time to half time to fourth time. And then I left MIT. I can't give you the exact year from memory, but I think... Uh, I think I, it was, was it 68? That could be. Or 58. Or 58. Maybe have been 58 even. 47, 50, 11 years, I think. Was that a difficult decision? Oh, sure it was, but BBM was growing so that something had to be done. And, uh, and I was the one to do it because Bolt was not uh, administrator of that, of that kind of thing. And certainly Newman wasn't. And so I was the only one in the company who could really run the, the thing. And I went to Brown and told him I, I had the leave and he was quite upset over this, but that's the way it was. We just. What, why was it so important for you to continue teaching even after you left? Well, uh, first place, I only taught in the summertime as summer courses. And this, this was the result of, of a, a law that was, a, a court decision that was made that said that for the first time, P, uh, companies could be sued for damage they did to hearing, not because just of an explosion, but damage that was created by exposure to noise over a period of years. It was a whole new concept of cumulated damage, not just explosive damage, which was the only thing that was paid for before then. This alarmed industry so because many of the industries were noisy and they didn't know what kind of a situation they're going to get into. And so it seemed that somebody had to teach some acoustics to start with so they'd understand how you made measurements, what, what, uh, what kind of noise were in different companies, what, what, what's the situation even, and where is this likely to go. And so uh, I talked with uh, Gordon Brown and we decided to set up a summer course, which I could still do by running MIT. I could get off time to do a two-week summer course uh, on on noise. While you were well, while I was running BBN. Running BBN, and so then I stayed on as a, as we call a lecturer at MIT, and I got these summer courses, which I ran for a period of about a half a dozen years or so, and they were very popular. They were the biggest enrollment in those of any summer course MIT had. And uh, uh, then out of that came books that I wrote. I wrote a book on noise reduction and a book on noise and vibration control. Both came out of that, those courses. Before that, MIT, I'd written a book on acoustics, which was out of my acoustics course. And then at Harvard, I'd written two books. So that, I, that, that started building up my 12 books that I wrote during my, my time on acoustics. Um, and then um, the, we didn't really talk about the, the, the design of speech communication systems. That, well, that, that, what, that paper, I, as I understand it, led to some national standards being set. Well, I'm not just sure that that was the paper. Um, of course, there, there, there are American standards on things that came out in that paper. That's true. Uh, but they were, those standards also embodied work that was done by the Bell Labs and some other people. They're sort of grouping, group standards, uh, taking ideas from different places. Uh, the one thing that I did that was basic in, in, uh, at the end, almost at the end of my tenure at, uh, at MIT was to look into how quiet do spaces have to be to be pleasant for people. In other words, can you write a specification saying that if you're going to have an office, the noise should not be any greater than so much, and you measure the noise. Uh, if you're in a home, noises shouldn't be greater than so much. If you want to be able to understand your TV and your radios and have family conversation. And in factories, the noise shouldn't be bigger than so much if you've got to shout at people. And you know, what, what are acceptable noise standards? Well, I wrote those. I did research on those, both uh, partly at MIT and partly at BBN, but it was done toward the end of my period at, at, uh, 
at MIT. And that led to what's called the NC curves, NC standards, noise control standards, that today every, everybody uses. If, if you're going to build an office, say the noise should be no greater than 35 NC decibels. And if you're going to have a concert hall, it should be no greater than 20 NC decibels. And this NC curves then have become an international standard today on noise. It's probably one of my uh, better known things that I did. And the textbook, your acoustics textbook, became the textbook in the field for a long time. A long time, and all over the all over the world, it was translated into other languages. And uh, uh, and the, and I had some new ideas on how to teach. Uh, how loudspeakers work and microphones work. And uh, uh, this led to the uh, two of my students, Vilcher and, and uh, what's the other one's name, building loudspeakers that would size you could put into your, into your library shelf and get good tone out of them. These small size loudspeakers uh, where it became in use, but it came as a result of the theories I'd put into my book. I should have invented the speakers, but I didn't think about it. These new small ones came out as a result of my students learning things from my book. A lot of the work that you have done that we've talked about really falls into the category of public service. Um, you did things for the public interest, starting, you know, from fixing noise in the cockpit to radar systems. And is that, is that a big, was that an important component for you, or was it more of a happenstance? Well, that's hard to answer that. It's something I was happy to do, whether you call it, uh, whether I took the initiative, whether it came to me as a question. Because you see, the one story I tell in my book, which I think is my biggest service to humanity, was getting mufflers put on airplanes so that they did not create the enormous noise nuisances that were the promise when the jet age came in to neighborhoods. And I tell the story of that in my book and how we fought with Boeing and with, with Pan American. That was around Idlewild? Idlewild think, Airport, yes. right, mm -hmm. J.F. Kennedy Airport now. And we, uh, I, I, with working with the Port of New York Authority, we developed the standards that the airplanes ought to meet, which required big mufflers on the airplanes, and they climbed steeply and cut back their power so they flew quieter over the neighborhoods. Big changes. And they were fought by these people. They didn't want to do it, you see. But because the Port Authority said you cannot land in New York unless you do what Brunick's crowd says, uh, you can't land in New York. And that was where the power came from, of course. I had no power. And then I wanted to ask about the, the Zapruder film. Was BBN involved in analyzing those acoustics? Well, now let's see. There, there's uh, two things that BBN was involved in, both of them after I was there. One of them was the missing uh, minutes in the Nixon tapes. And Dick Bolt was in charge of that. And they were working for uh, Judge Sirica, as I remember. Was that analyzing whether it was accidental or intentional? Right. And they decided that it was, it was intentional. But before it was determined who might have done it, Nixon resigned. And the whole thing was dropped then. Then the other one, of course, was the, was the as you say, the Dallas, Texas uh, assassination thing. And uh, I think that James Barger of BBN worked on that. And uh, they, they tried to, they tried to, they, they found that there was a motorcycle that was moving in that convoy and left their radio on. And so there was a recording back in the police station of every sound that that motorcycle picked up. And it picked up the shots. And so the question was, was there a fourth shot that might have come from the, the, the grassy knoll they talked about? And indeed, they found a noise that could have been from 
a shot or it could have been another motorcycle making a noise or something else. And so they, all, they, they said that the noise seemed, it seemed possible there could have been a fourth shot. But then uh, that's where it always ended. Nobody could prove it, you see. You have won a tremendous number of awards. And I'm wondering if there are any that have been particularly meaningful to you? Well, of course, uh, th th they're all meaningful. But the question is, which ones which ones are the, are the most prestigious? That's easy to answer. The most prestigious were the gold medals that came from, particularly from the Acoustical Society of America, Audio Engineering Society, and the American Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Those are their top awards, the gold medals. Then, of course, the President's National Science Medal is probably the top award of all because so few people get that. Only six to eight people a year uh, get uh, this, this award. And I was very fortunate, along with two of my students uh, before me, getting this, this award. And so that has melt, meant a very large amount to me. Uh, I would say that those are the most meaningful awards. And there have been a lot of others, as you noticed. What about your perspective on, on MIT? Are there any other thoughts you have about the, um, the particular role that MIT plays internationally? Well, of course, um, I've talked to some with your president about this. I say that, that one of the reasons that MIT has been so important in world, uh, well, in also in our various co companies that have been set up in this country, has been that they were willing to encourage their professors to start businesses. Secondly, there had to be a source of money, and this venture capitalism is very important, and, or whatever form it could take, the bank loans or whatever, to get these businesses up to the point where they could go on their own. And of course, MIT has got to do the proper kind of teaching so that you, you get the students to realize that maybe one of the best things I can do is to invent something and start a company. And I think MIT's got to continue with this. Uh, back some many years ago, uh, uh, one of the presidents, I forget which one it was now, uh, brought, had a, a banquet one evening. They brought in all the companies that had started companies out of MIT. This was, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And there were 110 companies that showed up at the banquet. And they, they, they all had been students at MIT who had gone out and formed companies that had been successful. And that's the kind of thing that MIT has got to continue. But you've got to do it with the, the school has to be willing to encourage your, your professors to go do that encourage invention and starting of companies. But you need the money to do it. And, and, and that's, that's my feeling about it. OK. Um, is there anything you want to speak to about the, either the administration or student body or your impressions of the faculty and what makes it unique or valuable? Well, of course. Uh, I'm, I've been out here a long time, so things have probably changed. But certainly in my day, uh, the idea that you could work as a, as, a, as a corporation with ideas that could be exchanged between the administration and the departments and the professors, and the professors and the, the department heads and the administration had some power, things could be done and changed. Those are what I liked about MIT. It was a vibrant place where change was possible. I hope it's still true. I'm hearing from other people that it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is that something, you know, you've come into contact with a lot of people from other places. So is that something that you think is pretty unusual? Well, MIT has certainly been more successful at it. I would say that Stanford has also. Stanford has done the same thing. 
and has been equally successful, the big Hewlett Packard and those companies that come out of Stanford. And they have the same idea. And of course, the whole Silicon Valley money out there was very important in the growth of that whole area. In fact, they've been, got more financial support there than we have in New England. And in some ways, uh, Silicon Valley looks more successful than MIT because of money. And so many of these companies that started here have almost gone out there uh, because that's where the money was. And that's why I say you've got to have both the concepts, the willingness of professors to start things and somebody to finance them. It, uh, one of the things that I, I was impressed by um, in doing the research for this interview was the way in which you've been able to blend the arts and sciences, your, your acoustical expertise with your love of music. And I wonder whether you want to talk to that a little bit. Well, I've always been interested in music. And I went to symphony concerts. When I was going to graduate school, the Boston Symphony played in Saunders Theater in those days on Tuesday evenings. They called them the Cambridge Series. I think they did about uh, eight concerts a year in Saunders Theater. And I always went to those concerts. And then when I was working for Professor Hunt as his assistant, uh, he uh, lived in Cambridge, of course, with his wife, and they had a, a new uh, child, a baby. And they had tickets to the symphony in Boston. And uh, uh, they, they said to me, well, if I come over and tend to the child while they went to the symphony concert, they would give me tickets to the symphony the nights they didn't want to go. So almost half the time they didn't go, so I went to Boston symphony concerts. Uh, and so right away I was interested in music, both partly because of the I told the experience of listening to operas back in, in Iowa, and I was all, also playing in dance bands. And, uh, uh, but I, I got very in, interested. I got interested in Serge Kusevitsky, the great leader of the Boston, early Boston Symphony. And uh, then when BBN got going, we got chances to work on things. We worked on the Kresge Auditorium, for example. Uh, we did other halls, and then Tanglewood came up, and we were asked to do the interior of the Tanglewood, what they call the Kusevitsky music shed out there. And that whole change you see inside, all the, the gray clouds that are ahead, and the surrounding of the orchestra, the back of the hall, all were changes that I was responsible for. Did you put the, were you the one who put the clouds? Right, exactly. And, and that was something I thought was one of my biggest achievements because it made such a difference in that hall. It changed it from being just a mediocre hall to a hall that is praised for its fine acoustics today. And it's a big hall with 5,000 seats in it. And uh, uh, then, uh, then when I got the Lincoln Center job, which as you read didn't turn out so well, uh, I got a chance to then study the halls of the world get data on them. I interviewed conductors and music critics. I got enormous volume of material. And from that have come three books on concert halls and opera houses. One in 1962, one in 1994 uh, uh, or something. And then the third one was in uh, 2004. So the three concert hall books have come out of it. The first one dealt with some 38 halls, and the last one with 100. So it's, they grew in importance and size. And great travels. And great travels. I think we're, we're probably at a good stopping point. Is there anything else? I know we, ha we, didn't, we haven't gotten to Channel 5 yet or a lot of the other work you did um, after BBN, but is there anything else at this point that you think is important to talk about? Of course, the one thing I didn't cover was my service with uh, the nonprofits. And I think that's been an important part of my life. I was uh, uh, first on the Board of Overseers at, at the Boston Symphony Orchestra, then I became chairman of the Board of Overseers, and then I became a member of the trustees and chairman of the Board of Trustees. And I 
help mold that symphony as it was going along. In fact, I was, along with Nelson Darling, was heavily responsible for hiring John Williams and brought him in. And uh, uh, so that, the success, and, and also I set up their financial system so they were going to almost go bro bankrupt when I got in there and I changed their financial system and today they have an endowment of around $300 million, which, uh, which is the biggest endowment of any symphony in the country. But it's all following the principles that I set up. Then I got to be president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the same thing happened. I, ch I changed the financial future of that organization and today it is so much different from what it was at the time I first came into it. I was president for only five years, but it's the, the presidents afterwards have carried on the same principles, and that's been important in my life. Then I was uh, president of the Acoustical Society of America, and uh, uh, in that uh, I changed the whole way that the thing was governed and it's been successful. Then I was chairman or president of the, uh, of the Audio Engineering Society. And although I didn't make so many changes there, it was a period of when I helped them do some new things at least. And so these nonprofit things have been an important part of my life. Why do you think? And then also I was on the board of overseers of Harvard University and that's our senior governing body, and I was there six years. And that was one of the most uh, exciting things that I did because you got a big university, and our group was responsible for maintaining academic quality in Harvard, and we took it seriously. And I, we're just about out of time, but w one last question. What is it that you've gotten out of this nonprofit work? that you haven't gotten out of the other work that you've done? Well, I, I think that it's different in, in the sense that in the, in the, in the company work, your, your, your goal is to provide a service for which you get paid, and you've got stockholders, and you've got a whole lot of things to balance. Working for the nonprofits, you don't have the, the business of, of, of sort of making any money for anybody. And your object is simply to do something better and do it well. And that's, that's uh, sort of the way I contrast these two things. But you're dealing with, you're dealing with, with people in a different way. It's, uh, in the nonprofit, you're dealing with their private lives more. Whereas in the company, you're dealing with serious matters of, of uh, if you're trying to help uh, Architects, you want to have the architects do a better job. You're trying to, you're trying to perform a service that is different from what you do when you're in nonprofits.